uh, the second um, panel, and we're just going to do what we did last time, which is both people will speak, and then we'll have questions at the end. So our first speaker <laughs> Sorry, <it's just> <laughs> is Will um, Will Bauer, who is finishing his PhD at UCL and hopes to be done by January or February, six months time. And the PhD is on. <laughs> I don't need to tell him. I'm sure. <laughs> and the PhD. <laughs> And the PhD is on the influence of Anglo-Italian uh, Anglo -Italian, uh, literary culture on the second generation romantics, especially Byron and Shelley. So, Will. So, um, I suppose there's a number of uh, routes this paper could take, and I've tried to consider a few of these approaches. I'm going to look at uh, aspects of institutional history, the people who brought the opera to the stage, analysis of public perceptions of the Italian opera, and the Italians who produced it, in an attempt to map the community. Um, some of it's a bit dry to begin with when we get into the kind of the, the what's and where's, but um, I hope it'll come through to, to have some good analysis at the end. Um, there's not going to be that much attention or close reading to operas of the period, uh, which is a shame, and interesting debates about the people on the other side of the stage, who they were, how they listened to opera, how this social type of listening differs from our sense of classical music. Uh, opera reviews by Hunt and Lamb, they also didn't make the cut. Um, but the things that did are interesting in their own right. So, uh, opera at the King's Theatre from 1707 to 1789. Well, the King's Theatre in Haymarket, built by Van Brett in 1705, had been the home of the Italian opera since the early 18th century. Operas would be, and there it is, courtesy of the Victorian Art Museum. Um, operas would be twice weekly, with an opera buffa, a comic opera, on a Tuesday, an opera seria on a Saturday, each would have two pairs of singers associated with it, the Buffa and the Syria, and then a backing group who would work on both comic and serious operas. They were performed in Italian as the European cosmopolitan standard, but native traditions like uh, Singspiel or English ballad opera did not have a place in the King's Theatre. So unlike lots of European cities where you'd have a kind of compromise between German traditions and, and native traditions, in the King's Theatre, an Italian what, op was the language of opera. So you had kind of weird things like Donizetti's Anna Bolena coming to London, a play by Anna Boleyn, or The Lady of the Lake by Rossini, obviously in Italian, and kind of even weirder things of um, successful English operas like uh, Michael Balfe's The Bohemian Girl will be translated into Italian <laughs> to be put on at the King's Theatre under the title of La Zinga. So in as much as it was a twice weekly <coughs> Italian language opera house at a site on the Haymarket, very little changed from the 1710s to the 1850s. But I um, wouldn't be presenting a paper on rebuilding the Italian opera if I didn't think there was a substantial change to talk about. So if the critical discourse of Romanticism regularly makes claims towards the importance of flux and revolution, then the Haymarket opera may be a suitable site for such a reading around the period 1785 to 1800. So there you go. So um, the news, um, it was in this chronology that things began to change for Italian opera in London and there began to be a debate over what its content should be, who should lead that content. Um, in all these things, you get a much greater focus on opera's high art, on an organic narrative form, something that early 18th century viewers wouldn't have found. This reformation of opera content and style was debated in a number of works about the opera. This is part of a general information explosion about the opera, which is going to come back to a lot in the talk. Um, it ranged from long prose tracks, specifically on the opera, about to discuss, opera being reviewed in periodicals, and the growth of London guides. Um, the publication of these new tracts, whether they were on subjects of opera finance or the opera itself, were often printed and or sold with the direct involvement of the creative community which ran the opera, and most of which occurred within two or three streets of the Haymarket. These longer prose tracts were the first of their kind in English in their technical and comprehensive discussion of opera. So, for example, quite famously, I suppose, the fourth volume of Charles Burney celebrated the general history of music, published in 1789, <coughs> devote this last section to an examination of the general state of music in England and implores musical operatic, uh, English operatic culture to take more and more from Italy. Uh, a second example is uh, John Brown's Letters on the Italian Opera. This is a much more like a, like a manual. Uh, it tells you a lot about the difference between aria, recitativo, different types of aria, how to tell when a certain aria is going on. It's very nice on translating Italian terms into, uh, into English. And you could, I suppose, say, Though you might be generalizing slightly, that um, the grand tour and uh, traveling was perhaps not available to some of the new upper middle class viewers of the opera. This was a nice way of them for getting into the kind of very specific lexicon of opera performance. 
uh, and the last one, the one I'll talk about for a bit longer, is this work, Ideas on the Opera by Monsieur Le Texier, and here is a huge quote from it. An opera may be compared to a complicated machine, the effort of which depends entirely on the harmonic concurrence of all its parts for the same purpose. If the least spring loses elasticity, if the smallest wheel receives the slightest collision on its pivot, the machine stops of itself. And, and then he goes on to say, if the composer isn't right, if the singer isn't right, if the stagehand isn't right, if the tailor isn't right, and ends by saying, in short, which this sentence is anything but, <laughs> If a skillful administrator does not hold all the strings of this machine with the greatest care, so as not to let a single one escape out of his directing hand, not had, we must not wonder if the enchantment being once vanished, the opera which by its nature to be the most agreeable becomes the most tedious of all entertainments. Now, what's remarkable about the Texier's opening is the sense that this is the opening of his um, ideas on the opera, is the sense of the equal importance between all the parts poet, composer, actor, which one assumes he means singers, ballet master, scene designer, must all be at their best to avoid tedium. Now this was certainly not the status quo. The singers, particularly the female prima donna, very much ran the show, demanded the omission of or inclusion of certain parts, uh, were by some way the best paid members of the troupe, um, and yet Latexi asked them to sing and deliver with verity and propriety. So what you get here is a little signpost of the end of the age of the prima donna uh, and the end of what we call the pasticcio opera, uh, wh whereby, um, let's say, a famous Catalani or a famous prima donna would be performing an opera buffa, but she knew a better aria or an aria that was better suited to her voice during it. She would demand that the composer would then put that in, even though it had no narrative function within the opera that she was performing because she was, you know, she was the business. And the end of this cut and paste style is a small part of what uh, William Weber has called the 2008 work of the same name, The Great Transformation of Musical Taste, which tracks the kind of much more, more general end of <sighs> gala com uh, performances whereby song and dance, popular music, <coughs> opera can all exist on the same stage at the same time and towards what we consider to be the opera today. Now, in a vain attempt to, a vague attempt rather, to get back to the modern day, I was kind of struggling with my confidence on this, but I was on the tube on a Sunday morning, a little bit worse for wear, and I saw an advert for this, uh, the Classical Spectacular, which has its 25th anniversary at the Royal Albert Hall uh, on Tuesday, 21st November. I put the dates there if you want to go along. Um, <laughs> and it's an idea of this form, actually, this kind of 18th century form of Gala, which we kind of associate with last night of the proms, but that's not quite what this is because if you think about it, they're mostly um, non lyric and they're mostly in English. Whereas these, you've got a good range of Puccini, Verdi, Wagner, um, Monti, Vivaldi, <coughs> replete with thundering cannons and fireworks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's just to say that you know, to, to say that these kind of things end there is a, and all they go with the music hall, that's what a lot of criticism would say. You get a split between the opera house and the music hall. It's not, it's not quite uh, true, I wouldn't say. Uh, so, back to the late 18th, late 18th century. Um, to a certain extent, the transformation in style was following the continent. The Texier was French, had worked at the Paris Opera, and Bernie had done most of his research in the 1770s in Italy. The Haymarket Opera itself was run by a cabal of Italians who had been in regular contact with continental currents. But I'd like to offer uh, two interrelated suggestions as to why I think there's an exclusive London aspect to this change in the creative community. And both of them kind of work on the principle of a blank canvas. That uh, there was two things that happened: one financial and one, well, fire-based. <laughs> the right adjective would be um, uh, that, uh, that really um, changed these. Um, <coughs> one being quite simply, uh, there was so little money and so much bankruptcy and so much turnover of staff at the opera due to mismanagement, and there was a general feeling that something must be done. A number of tracks were written both by, as in the text on the left. Uh, and against, as in the text on the right, uh, those who ran the King's Theatre. Uh, and if, if you want an interesting afternoon, call these up, and tables, double entry bookkeeping, and it's really dry <laughs> mathematical work to work out who's on the right side or the wrong side, uh, and I haven't worked out. Um, but this sense for more of an institution within the theatre, and the will to revise the form within the cultural press in those three tracks we saw earlier, was given a pretty big opportunity by the events of the evening of the 7th of June, 1789, when uh, the King's Theatre was um, ablaze and burned to the ground, something on which Horace Walpole reflected to uh, Mary and Agnes Berry, 
Have you shed a tear over the Opera House? Or do you agree with me that there is no occasion to rebuild it? The nation has long been tired of operas and has now a good opportunity of dropping them. Something about that kind of repetitive, uh, led by the, the singers, non, uh, the, the, the lack of power in the form is kind of conveyed by uh, Walpole there. But the judgment that Walpole comes to, that just after 100 years we should probably leave the Italian opera well alone, is one, op is one possible option, but the other, and the one which a growing number of Italian immigrants and exiles chose to pursue, backed by wealthy British investors, was to rebuild an opera in London to rival at first physically, but I would argue then that these architectural ambitions mirror a, um, a musical rivalry, the greatest opera house in the world, which as we all know it is what? La Scala. Um, uh, this is Luigi Piermarini's Teatro La Scala, built in Milan in 1778, which inspired the grand plans of the 1790s in London to convert the relatively unostentatious Van Burr original into the second largest theatre in Europe, which would house some two and a half thousand people. Um, now, the text here wrote, the reason why the 1788 to 1790 time is really interesting because they weren't certain how they'd replace it, like Walpole said, whether they replace it at all. And so the text here gets in just before with another whopping great uh, sentence, or maybe it's a couple of sentences, um, about what he thinks should replace it. We must not think that the best architects in the world, such as Palladio, Vitruve, Benini, would meet with gr the greatest success in building an opera house in London. Whoever will undertake it must submit his ideas to the national taste. It will be not enough to execute with correctness the finest proportions to display the most masterly knowledge of the rules of architecture and even to possess a particular power to join the magnificent magnificence with elegancy and taste in general. I maintain that the architect must know the taste of the nation and be extremely careful how to please that taste. It is not necessary then to invite over any architect and indeed London contains architects of the greatest abilities, such as would do honour to all the nations in the world. Sir William Chambers, who built Somerset House, Mr. Wyatt, the Pantheon, Mr. Adams and Holland, who have executed several buildings of great magnificence, and among the foreigners who have been long settled in London and are well acquainted with the manners and customs of the country, Messrs. Wieselski and Bonamy. Now, the play between English and Italian values in the extract reveals an important undercurrent which will come up repeatedly in the remaining, in, in the rest of the talk. In some cases it will come up in a very cosmopolitan way, and in others with a rather more xenophobic tone, and that is the relationship and tension between an opera house which is known almost exclusively as the Italian Opera House, and is run almost exclusively by Italians, and yet creates its opera and makes its money within the English capital, a capital which is being stirred up by some of the things we heard Amoris talk about, French revolutionary um, uh, suspicion of the foreigner, uh, of the exile. Um, in the end, the man they chose is the man mentioned uh, penultimately in the text his list to get the commission. This gentleman, uh, Michael Novoselsky. Um, just quickly on the portrait, I think it's quite interesting how <coughs> the text is talking about how the person needs to have both the taste of the English and the Italian. I think sitting for this portrait is very much doing that. This is a man born in Rome and Italian, and yet he's sitting in a very Georgian uh, uh, Reynolds Manor, painted by a friend um, of Reynolds. So you've got in, in the portrait itself that kind of uh, endorsement. Now, uh, despite uh, the portrait and the text's endorsement, Novoselsky was not a grand architect, uh, or not an experienced architect at least. He was like a lot of uh, Italian migrants, a bit of a jack of all trades. So if you were here, you'd be a stage designer, you'd be a stage manager, you'd be occasional scene painter, you'd paint the, the roofs of the boxes, you'd also get to design the opera house, in uh, Novoselsky's case. And uh, <laughs> what you see in his hand is, if you can squirt your head a little bit, the opera house itself. Uh, I spent Wednesday morning in the Sir John Stone Museum uh, looking at the um, designs of the opera house. Uh, they've got a wonderful one, which is, uh, you'll see why I'm not showing you them in a second, uh, which is um, the Haymarket Opera House as it was, and then superimposed over in red, the new opera house, and it gives you an idea of the scale of it. I mean, it really was. The whole edifice of the original building was covered just by the amphitheatre of the, of, the, of the new one. He bought a lot of property around it. Um, the woman who does the uh, computer images is off for the week. I didn't know that before I went, uh, so uh, the images that I found are absolutely not apparent. But uh, I did go and see them, and I can uh, <coughs> tell you that they were interesting. Uh, <laughs> now, you have to take my word. So this is fully re-established in 1793. Um, and in some ways, the reordered theatre 
established itself at just the right time um, and had its public image uh, reordered at the right time as well because uh, it was a time when the 1790s, a great deal of publishers were producing, uh, there was a, uh, an information explosion. Um, and one example of this is the plan of the boxes, which began with the New King's Theatre. This was produced um, every year uh, from 1796, and what it was, that's very self explanatory, is um, a duodecimo with who was where in the Opera House. So you could find box number 30 would be La Lady Jane Dundas. Number 31, the Duke of Portland, and as they changed and who they were with would be on there. I think there's a decent amount of work to be done on the difference between where people sit, whether people move, box, what box you think, apart from obviously the Regent's box and the King's box, which box is perceived to be the best, if you can rank people through that. I think that would be quite an interesting uh, experiment. Also into you know who buys these. Do you only buy these if you are someone who has a box and you want to know where other people are? Or do you buy them if you're a reviewer and you want to know who's sitting in that box up there? That kind of thing. I think it's quite an interesting way to look at the community. But um, for those not from London or didn't have a box, any number of guides told the opera's prices and its schedules. There's a couple of examples, but we all know these books. There's so many of them. The Ambulator. Uh, the one on the left, uh, Roach's London Pocket Pilot, is specifically for someone uh, intended as a companion to the Fortnight's Ramble. So if you've got two weeks, uh, and you want to see what's going on, this is a good way of doing it. Uh, and it's very positive about the new Haymarket. Uh, Haymarket is allowed to be the most superb in Europe. The theatre is deep and proportional broad. The variety and beauty of the scenes are beyond expression, and the mecha mechanism exquisitely replete with ingenuity and contrivance. The amphitheatre theater from the stage appears a kind of paradise, and when entirely filled, may be justly said to transcend our most luxurious idea of oh, heaven. So uh, tall, <laughs> tall praise indeed. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about uh, the, in, the the box publications, a few of these guides, the the three tracks I showed earlier, and the, um, the 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 operas themselves, is that they were all published nearby to the opera house. Which sounds pretty, um, not not particularly interesting, but. If, if you look at the, the regularity that these were published, 66 and 59 Pall Mall, uh, Lorenzo de Ponte, who's obviously Mozart's the breadist for a time and who was in London for about a decade, he has a bookshop where he sells Italian books uh, and he has the rights as the poet at the opera to sell scores. Henry Reynolds is quite proud to say that 20 Piccadilly near the Haymarket. And Michael Kelly, um, who was one of the great singers of the age, he was in uh, the premiere of Don Giovanni in. Vienna or Salzburg, I think Vienna, um, built his own shop on Pall Mall and he spared no cost, stocked it well with other music besides my own engaged shopmen, porters and opened it to the public on the 1st of January 1802. Now that gives an idea of the opera and I find it quite difficult to create a causal path for the changes to the opera that I've just addressed. In fact I think there are a number of possible teleologies which seem viable. Did the financial ruin create the uncertainty to catalyse debates about the purpose of the opera? or rather the lack of purpose and the sameness of Italian opera in London since the 1760s caused the financial ruin in the first place. I suppose most contentiously, and something we're never going to find out, was the fire which burnt down the opera house in 1799, arson by a disgruntled employee, that was one of the things that was always said, or was it an insurance job by the people who actually owned the opera in the first place? There's also at least two wider societal factors that I've discussed, the, the, the information boom which wasn't driven by the opera house, uh, and the French Revolution which also wasn't driven by the opera house, um, <laughs> which, which muddied the water. So, to, to kind of, uh, I'm a f the, this, the, the last third of the, of the thing, we'll look at kind of two different functions of this community. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there were sociable functions uh, to the opera, aside from the music. It was a place where you were seen, being seen, talk, flirt. Uh, if you remember the scene in Where Angels Fear the Tread, uh, when Philip Harriton and Harriet Abbott are in the opera house, and they're very amazed that people are talking and getting on and getting, you know, uh, kind of being a bit raucous. That's very much the, the idea we have of um, late 18th century opera. But that may give us an idea um, which is a bit too far removed from the serious opera that we see today, because even in this period, there was an, a sense of pushing sociability away from the auditorium and into other parts of the theatre. Michael Kelly's shop that I just mentioned, for example, or Lorenzo de Ponte's wife, um, English wife, uh, had her own little coffee shop uh, in the grounds of the Haymarket. As the opera is the rendezvous of all that is gay, pleasurable in the metropolis, this coffee room would be an admirable resort for a lounge 
and maybe the means of reducing FOPs alley, as well as the stage from half their nocturnal, nocturnal tenants. It is certain that in this more remote haunt, the elegant beau may indulge in his promenade with less interruption to the audience, and fashionable badinage may be reconciled with decorum. But what of the community itself? Uh, those, both those operations were run by people in the creative community. Where did members of the opera go to socialize? Well, unanimously it seems, they decided on going to the Orange Coffee House. If you look in Roach's guide, that tells you that in the Haymarket Hall, the Orange Coffee House is chiefly used by opera dancers and castratas. Uh, Giuseppe Baretti, probably the most famous 18th century Italian, uh, just before he famously stabbed a pimp uh, in, the, in the altercation, he went to the Orange Coffee House to check if he had his mail, which gives me the sense that maybe quite a few Italians would get their post delivered there. Um, uh, Michael Kelly, when he talks about the Opera House burning and one of the chief culprits, he said, um, couldn't have been him because, quote, the suspect's incendiary was coolly supping at the Orange Coffee House watching the progress of the flames. But as well as being a place where actual people from the opera went, it becomes <coughs> um, a useful collective signifier for those with a bone to pick about the opera and the people that run it. So uh, in this um, satire by not really Vittorio Nemesis, but uh, Michael Collabadini, um, where he is attacking Lorenzo de Ponte, uh, <laughs> not very nicely, uh, someone who bored the, the Germans at Vienna and is mocked in England, not, not a positive, he's got a sort of grudge to bear. He said, and he has a second dedication to Andrea Marugi, who for 30 years was the second and the first, um, well, <laughs> both uh, comic singer and buffoon uh, of, of, of Europe, and those who uh, not quite frequent, more like hang around in the Orange Coffee House, so that's who he's attacking in this. Uh, and it then started to get a little. Well, what you get here is a slightly more uh, British-based attack on the Orange Coffee, well, on the kind of Italian who goes there. So this is um, the Petit Motrier at the beginning of something called the Earwig, a tale of a German artist uh, trying to pursue an English rose. He's deeply smitten by how gorgeous she is. Uh, he, she gets with him, takes all his money, and then leaves him. Uh, and he being a man of very warm mind, little short of madness, he became on this occasion almost insane, and for six weeks he sought night and day in vain for the habitation of the fair inconstant, and employed a legion of foreigners in the pursuit. In short, he emptied the orange coffee house of its dun-coloured company. So, now in that last phrase you get a small sense of how following institutional history can lead to the exposure of underlying cultural trends. Although it's only a mild insinuation of the morals of these foreigners, it shows an aspect of Regency Anglo-Italian relations which was set to intensify during the War of the Second Coalition. In the period, depictions of foreigners, I think we talked about this a bit before, but John Bull becomes a bit more macho and the foreigner becomes a bit more emaciated. Um, these depictions also you know, were borne out by uh, bills in Parliament. The Aliens Act, for example, prevented the alien from leaving the port where he landed. Detention indefinitely without trial was permissible, extradition and transportation. Although inspired by the revolution in France, these laws did work uh, against the Italians. The Piemontese violist uh, Viotto was expelled from the King's Theatre and expelled from uh, Britain for revolutionary tendencies. Uh, and after I found this out a few years ago, I went to the National Archives and looked at other people who'd been chucked out, nameless people, not famous people. And uh, 95 Italian peddlers and organ grinders were removed within a month of Viotto's remove, removal. And the, the document which gets rid of them talks about them, their, their guilt was of either defrauding the people or, as in many instances, dispersing seditious and improper publications. Uh, whether the, the all 95 peddlers and all growers did that, I think would be up for debate. But um, there's a sense of, if you want to target Italians, a good place to go is music. It's the musical industry and the musical community because that's where they worked. Now, this is the final slide. Uh, a good way of looking into this and a good way of looking at the most things, I think, is Charles Dibdin. He's just a very interesting guy. To find a musical expression of this new nationalism, uh, Dibdin's probably the, the, the best example. The most renowned songwriter and performer of the period, and was paid by the government for his British war songs in 1803. In addition to these, he penned, penned a wide range of anti-Semitic and xenophobic ditties, uh, in which Italians were a regular target. And the one of most interesting today is Jack at the Opera. Jack's a regular figure in Dibdin's work. He's a kind of naive John Bull. Uh, he's your average Englishman. He's your Joe Bloggs. Uh, and I'm just gonna look at the bits in red. It begins, a whopping I landed and called to hail Mog. She had just shaped her course to the play. 
of two runs and one walk that I ordered my grog and to speak her soon stood underway. But the haymarket I for old Drury mistook, like a lover so raw and so soft. Half a George handed out, at the change did not look, manned the rattlings and went up aloft. He goes to the haymarket, he's not best impressed by what's on there. He asks what the play is, he doesn't know. With their squeaking so mollyish, tender and soft, one can scarcely know man from monsieur. So, you know, these men sound like women, these women sound like men. Twas, you see, rather oddish to me, and so I sung out, pray, be decent, my dear, consider I've just come from sea. And it concludes, tent an Englishman's taste to have none of these goes, so away to the playhouse I'll jog, leaving all your fine bantams in man parasos for all Billy Shakespeare and Mog. So I made the theatre theater and hail my dear spouse, you know, off they go, hand in hand, back to Wapping. <laughs> right. But the, the important point is, you know, this gentleman has just got off, let's say, a Navy ship, but it could be a merchant ship, but in my nice reading, I'm making it a Navy ship, and he's just come back from, from war, or from um, being in Europe. Uh, he wants a good bit of English entertainment in this nation's capital. He f- meets his girlfriend, but he, he mistakes it for the Haymarket. There's kind of all sorts of uh, feminizing of Italian Italians going on there, which is very typical of uh, the, the period of kind of feminizing the, the, the European, but not feminizing them in a po- positive way, but making them men more feminine. Um, and it meant this kind of growth in xenophobia. But you got things like the alien, uh, which was Mr. a violinist at the opera who wasn't paid uh, for months on end. Uh, he uh, decided to produce a statement saying, I haven't been paid, I've been singing in your opera buffa, and I've been playing the violin at another theatre, why haven't you paid me? And the, the response of uh, Mr. Revel was, well, you're an alien frankly, I don't need to pay you. Because that was one of the nice ways you could work these things. Obviously, it, wasn't, it was completely illegal, but there was enough backing within the popular press to have some sympathy for Revel's view. And this is the last quotation. I've now advanced to a passage in his work which, when the reader looks over it and reflects upon the facts as they really exist, he will think, I think, blush to hear that any person calling himself an English gentleman of high family would have set up such a plea as that of alien enemy against any demand that might be made of him particularly such as a demand as the one made by me, after this decision I had manifested to adjust our pecuniary difference in the most honourable, temperate, and easy way possible. Good heavens, if this were to be the acting principle of society, what is to become of the trading intercourse of the, this great commercial empire? I think the end's rather important. You know, at the start you've got this kind of invocation of the English gentleman by an Italian, a bit like the Novoselsky portrait. You've got someone trying to naturalise themselves, trying to endear themselves to an English reader by saying, one. I hold the same values that you do. I know what an English gentleman is. And then the end is this great commercial empire that I am now a part of, I'm going to invoke again. How can this person who claims to be a real Englishman, me the foreigner, who he accuses of being a foreigner, how can I interfere with that discourse? And I think that's a fitting place to conclude. Um, I try to go from the opera to sociability um, and specifically at the coffee house and then to a wider cultural trend in Dibden. But that goes back to a specific example within the coffee house, within the creative community, which I think shows the value of a rebuilding approach, which discusses not just the actual fairly dry rebuilding of the haymarket, but the methods which we use to rebuild historical creative communities. Thanks. Thank you very much, Will. Our second speaker.